This is actually my daughter here. When I grew up, I grew up in a very similar fashion. You know, I'd be out taking care of dogs and I took so many naps in dog houses that I've lost count. I've been racing dogs my whole life. This is what we grew up in and it's, it is my passion. And I've been fortunate enough in the past few years to see real success in this. We won the Iditarod in 2012, became the youngest person ever to do so. At the time, I was 25 years old, just barely. I turned 25 the day before the Iditarod started. At that point, the 20-year average for an Iditarod champion was 42 years old. I was 17 years younger than what an Iditarod champion was supposed to be. 2014, I set the record for the fastest Iditarod time ever. We did it in eight days, 13 hours, and some odd minutes. And that was a huge leap forward. That beat the previous record by more than five hours. The Iditarod is the longest sled dog race in the world. It travels over 1,000 miles across Alaska. The Iditarod was first run in 1973 in an effort to keep sled dogs alive in Alaska. Sled dogs were quickly disappearing with the arrival of snow machines and airplanes that were taking over the transportation business in the state. My grandfather, along with about 30 other adventurous mushers, set off to cover the historic Iditarod Trail, a trail system that had been used for the previous about 75 years to provide supplies to all the mining towns across the state of Alaska. When they set off to go all the way from Anchorage to the far northwest coast of Alaska in the city of Nome, it was unknown whether or not a single dog team could travel that entire distance. It really was an expedition. My grandfather finished that first race in third place. He kind of started a family legacy or a family business along with actually helping to start the Iditarod race itself. My dad was 14 years old when that first Iditarod ran and he got hooked. He must have been about 30 years old when he started his kennel and took on racing the Iditarod seriously and I was about five years old at the time. That's the environment that I grew up in. The Iditarod starts in downtown Anchorage. It's the largest population mass in the state with about 300,000 of the 600,000 people the state has. Once you leave the starting line, there's not another road for the rest of the thousand miles. The dog teams run day and night, but anything you have to do with these dogs, whether it's bedding them down, feeding them, any repairs to your sled or equipment or preparing for the next run, all has to be done by the driver, him or herself. Now, when I was five years old, I had this image in my mind about what it would be like to win the Iditarod. And there are a few kind of iconic images around that, one of which is driving that dog team down Front Street, the crowds of people. The other iconic image is the musher sitting there with his lead dogs, draped in the yellow roses. This is what I envisioned winning the Iditarod would be. In reality, it was something a little bit different. <laughs> When I was 16 years old, I ran my first pro race, and I finished fourth by one minute. I beat, what was it, 13 mushers in that race. And at the time, I thought this was the perfect race. We built a big team, we went to the race, we raced really hard, we finished with zero fuel. I ran the last 20 miles of that race in front of the sled, in front of the sled, actually pulling with the dogs. In racing, and in my mind, this was viewed as the perfect race, finishing with zero fuel left in the tank knowing your team well enough to know exactly how much fuel and how hard you could push and still be able to reach the finish line. I wanted to become the youngest person ever to win the Iditarod. We gave us four Iditarods to accomplish that goal. So the dogs that I was able to procure for that 2009 Iditarod were later kindly referred to as the Scrubs. They were the biggest mixed match group of dogs you could possibly imagine. Every single dog on my team had failed in another kennel. The only consistent factor in these dogs is they'd all proven that they couldn't hang with the big boys. As I went through the team and tried to figure out what has caused each of these dogs to fail in the past. We tried to look at it from their eyes. And what we saw is that doing the longer runs, the big long trips, the big hard pushes are the things that brought out the weaknesses in these dogs. Racing at my dad's level, where most of them had been, they had been expected to do 70 to 80 mile runs, recuperate in maybe five to six hours, and then get back on the trail again. We knocked it back to a sustainable pace. We brought it down and had to rebuild the dog's confidence. That was one of the hugest factors here. And we never did a run more than 40 miles. We set that as a standard. We wanted these dogs to know that every time we took off, as long as I was on the back of the sled, their new musher, we were gonna do something that they were capable of. We set small goals to begin with. We started doing this routine and we started focusing on building a sustainable training and racing style that wasn't about kind of playing on the dog's super athleticism qualities. We brought this team together, completely revamped their training and racing style, 
rather than focusing on setting a very high level of operation and hiring employees at $100 an hour to be able to operate at that high level and then putting them in an environment where this is the standard, you either do it or get out. We set it up to say, this is the group we have to work with. How are we going to set them up to succeed in this, in this environment? And we ended up finishing the Iditarod in sixth place, which was phenomenal, honestly. What we realized was once we got on the Iditarod and raced at a sustainable pace the entire way, because I was more concerned about finishing the race than trying to be competitive, the dog team continued to build and excel. And we saw greater speed in the team because they knew what to expect. Each run they got up, and they weren't afraid of this being a run that was above their level. They knew what the run was going to be. They knew that I would stop before it was a too, too long of a distance for them. In the checkpoints, they rested and ate and recuperated far more effectively because they knew our routine. My realization was that our previous thought on racing dogs, the idea that a race was about going out there, building up the team, and then starting the race and pushing as hard as you can, was not the best way to do it. You could sustain a team. You could build a team over the course of the race. And we started working on this kind of theory of building a positive spiral. Well, each success built on the previous success, rather than the negative spiral that most mushers had been operating on, where they would do a big challenging run, and the best 75% of the athletes in the team would eat well, the other 25% would be suffering or struggling, and then again, the dogs would be a little bit weaker on the next run, and it would appear to be a bigger challenge to them because they hadn't recuperated well. In 2012, after having continued to work on the same theory, I guess, for the past three years, we set off on our final chance to become the youngest person ever to win the Iditarod. We started out the Iditarod in 2012, continuing this theory and developing the dogs on the race. And ultimately, you have to forget about your competition. Because when you're on the Iditarod, the best chance you have of winning the race is getting to the finish line as quickly as possible. But it's amazing how many people miss that point. Because in a race, what do we start doing? We start racing our competition. We start looking at our competition and what are they doing? Oh, he's six hours ahead, he's four hours ahead. And you try to catch up with them. The leaders try to bolster their confidence by being on par or keeping up with their competition. We had to let go of a lot of that. And that is a difficult thing to do. You have to look at your team, because your team is the only team that you have control over on the Iditarod. It was pretty easy to do that for the first 700 miles. Because I was in the middle of the pack, I had confidence that we were setting a good pace. We were within striking distance. I knew that it was possible for us to win the Iditarod. Not likely, not likely by a long shot. The only problem came along about 300 miles into the Iditarod when our style was working so well that I was actually in the lead of the race at 300 miles to go rather than being in position to catch up with 300 miles to go. That had been our plan. And all of a sudden, things started looking different because now we were actually in the lead. And there's a lot of media attention. For the first time, people were looking at us and saying, what is Dallas going to do? And the standard was when a musher broke and actually got into the front, they tried to make a run for it as hard as they could and get as much distance between them and second place as possible. And usually in the process of making that big push, inevitably, they would weaken their team. And then the whole pack would catch up again, and then somebody else would break and try to get way out in front. And again, they would falter, and the teams behind them would catch up. So we almost did that. It just kind of occurred to me, why in the world would I do that? Why would I change the one thing that's been working so well the entire way, only because that's how everybody before us had ever done it? So that was actually our decision at that point, is I'm going to build this team. I'm going to keep building them. We don't need to race these guys yet. And the result was, is we ended up playing a cat and mouse game with my other top competitor at that point, which was a, a lady named Allie Zirkel, one of the best dog drivers we've seen in many, many years. We ended up playing a cat and mouse game all the way down the trail where I would outrun her team by 40 or 50 minutes on a 40 to 50 mile run. And then we'd get to the checkpoint and I would give that time, instead of taking that time and trying to get another 40 or 50 minutes ahead of her on the next run, I stayed right with her. I stayed there as long as I could and gave my dogs as much rest as I could. And then on the next run, we'd outrun her by five minutes more and then 10 minutes more. And we kept reinvesting that energy and that effort the dogs gave me into rest. So in the 2012 race, we finally crossed the finish line, became victorious, and accomplished our goal of becoming the youngest person to ever win the Iditarod. But what I felt was the bigger accomplishment in that was the learning, I guess the learning curve of sorts that we went through and the realizations, actually having the opportunity to race in the front of this race and realizing that our opponents were still just humans and canines and they had to play by the same rules we did. 
We weren't any different than them, even though we were much younger and much less experienced. And the experience we gained on this race was crucial.